Welcome to a specially co-produced podcast this week between Beyond the Noise with me, David Jameson, and All Hail the Pod with Jim Slaven. For this special edition, uh, we'll have a slightly lengthier podcast than usual, uh, taking in about an hour and 20 minutes, in fact, covering a huge range of subjects in contemporary politics where I discuss with Jim uh, contemporary class politics, Brexit, the state of Scottish politics, uh, and as I say, very much else. Um, besides, uh, I hope you uh, enjoy this special edition. Hello, I'm Jim Slavin from All Hail to the Pod, and I'm joined by David Jameson from Common Space Beyond the Noise podcast. David, good to Hi. see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. And we're just going to sit and have a chat about politics here, which is Hi. an excellent way to spend the afternoon. Indeed it is. I suppose there's really nowhere else to start to talk about politics other than the one issue that is dominating, which is Brexit. Yeah. So, I mean, there's so many... Brexit's one of the things that's operating in so many, many different layers. Yeah. It's difficult to know where to start with. Mm-hmm. But just firstly, give me a sort of sense of your your gut response to it. What, where are we with Brexit? Um, I think that we've got to a point with Brexit where it's becoming clear, even to people who didn't understand this, that Brexit is first and foremost a crisis of the British state formation and of the British elite. Because up until this point, I think a significant portion of commentary, particularly on the left, sometimes on the right as well in a different way, was that Brexit was some kind of uh, uh, coherent strategy or even master plan or conspiracy to take the British state in a new direction by which it could renew itself and sort of renew the vitality of of British capitalism, which is obviously weakened um, in recent decades. And so you got sort of Empire 2.0 was one of those theories that you saw kind of banded around on the right and the left. There were people clearly on the right who imagined that Britain could somehow approximate the position it held at the time of the British Empire. You know, it could become a new global trading regime. Always a fantasy. It simply logistically cannot happen. Um... And on the left, people thought, you know, this was a new plan by elements of the elite to sort of bring in a Thatcherism 2.0 that would be used to attack the working class and lower living standards and so on. There's no obvious coherent sense in which that's uh, the truth either. Apart from anything else, and this is a major, I think, misunderstanding about contemporary politics, you can't just do Thatcherism over and over again. Actually, a lot of big capitalists now in the Western world say the problem isn't regulation. The problem's under regulation. The problem isn't um, that the state's too involved in the economy. The problem is the state's not involved enough because decades of Thatcherism has left us with a deeply damaged, decrepit uh, economy dominated by financialization. And if you open the pages of something like the Financial Times, you'll find plenty of people on the right who recognise what the problems are. So this idea that the, the strategies of capitalism are just a constant race to the bottom uh, is is a, is a generalisation. So I think by the point we're in now, and the most important part of this recognition, I think, in, in uh, among wide layers, is the dreadful state that the faction fight in the Tory party uh, has reached. People used to compare this to the Corn Laws, which was a famous conflict between two different parts of British conservatism, um, way back, and that was the kind of seminal clash uh, of of different elements of the ruling elite uh, in the past. Actually, I think it surpassed that conflict. And for the first time, I'm starting to wonder if the Conservative Party can survive the crisis. Mm. And if you'd have told me that two or three years ago, I would have said, it's the party of British capitalism. It's guided the state since before Britain was a parliamentary democracy, you know, uh, which tells you something about the the forces that it, that it represents. Um, but it's clear that the ruling class has gotten themselves into a terrible, terrible position. Um, and it looks to me like there's regret all round. Um, but it's very difficult now for those different factions to, to back down. And it, it tells us, I think, quite a lot of interesting things about contemporary British society and contemporary British capitalism. One is that relations between the social classes are are a very low ebb. The working class do not trust the elite layers of British society at all and are completely unwilling to listen to the constant demands that they rein in 
uh, their their sort of votes and their activity, but also that relations within the ruling class have also grossly deteriorated. There's real hatred now, I think, between elements of like the Tory benches. So, I mean, it's a pretty interesting opening, I think, in British history. And also, I'm interested what you're saying there about the stuff with Thatcherism and deregulation. Or, mm. Because as well as being a crisis in the British state, Brexit also represents one of the outworkings of the crisis in the global economy, mm. and particularly in the EU. Mm-hmm. Now, we are a bit distant from that slightly because mm. you know, we've got Brexit going on, but also because we're not in the Eurozone. Mm. But if you look at what's happening in even, even strong economies like Germany and France, yeah. there's serious problems. And obviously we know what's happened with Greece and we've got Italy. And one of the debates is around about the neoliberal nature of the EU. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding as if neoliberalism is like the market having free reign. Mm. Where in actual fact, neoliberalism is about a systems-based where the economy is run and the r- role of the organisation like the EU is absolutely crucial in that. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be missing sometimes for the discussion we're having about Brexit here, where it's like, oh, we're, all, we're going to end up like Singapore or something. Mm-hmm. But it's actually much more complicated than that, and it's to do with the global economy itself. And we've seen many, many manifestations of that working out throughout the globe. Trump yep. being another one. Mm-hmm. So, I don't. I mean, I think it's quite interesting to look at it from both sides. We can see it for a sort of internal... British, UK, including Ireland, in the sense of what's happening over there, mm-hmm. where we can include that in the debate we're having. But there's also another way to look at that, which is what this crisis or crises are running much deeper yeah. than they've been recognised where we are sitting, particularly in Scotland, mm-hmm. where we've seen through the prism of the national question. And this is also this is an old misunderstanding uh, on the left as well, going back to the time when I first got involved in politics, which was around sort of 2000, where I was first becoming conscious of politics, it was around the year 2000. And there were lots of people uh, on the in the kind of what people called the anti-globalisation movement who said what neoliberal, neoliberalism is and what globalisation is is, as you say, just the unleashing of free markets. And that was never really true, and it was never true in quite a fundamental sense, which is that... Um, Globalisation used to be some, called something else on the anti-capitalist left. It used to be called imperialism. Um, and the conditions for what we call globalisation, the fundamental condition for what we call globalisation, is the um, historically unique hegemony of the United States as an imperial force. Obviously, at the end of the, the Soviet Union, the United States was an unparalleled global power, and it is unparalleled in history. Rome has nothing on, on the United States as a, as a hegemonic world force. The, the US itself used to refer to this as full-spectrum dominance. They dominated everything. They dominated all of the major global institutions. The World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the European Union is to considerable degree an outgrowth of American um, power. But they also dominated... The global currency, they dominated the world militarily. The United States military is more powerful than all its competitors put together, of course. Um, now, what we're going through now is what economists are calling a period of de- deglobalization. Since about 2010, um, global production has generally outstripped global trade. So we're no longer in the, in the globalization phase. And the reason for that, the primary reason for that, is that there's a new... Uh, competition in the global economy and Trump for example articulates this perfectly, it's China for as long as America was that dominant free trade so called was good because America was dominating it. now that there's a trading competitor to the United States free trade not so good which is why there's a massive expansion in protectionist um, measures. Yesterday I think was the 70th anniversary of NATO and the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, foreign minister, or whatever the equivalent is, actually said, security threats are changing. The new great security threat is Chinese competition. And I really enjoyed that, because I love the idea that America's main economic competitor emerging is a security <laughs> threat, you know, whatever that means. But that's what lies behind the fragmentation of the Western order that, that, that has grown up in the last... 20, 30, 40 years. So as you say, there are big international forces at play here. And it's very easy when you live in one small corner of that development, Brexit, 
or, you know, people in the, in the US, they think that Trump is a uniquely US phenomenon, right? And of course, in a sense, it is because they're the heart of the empire. Um, and a lot of people in Britain think that Brexit is a uniquely British phenomenon. The whole, the rest of the world is still doing globalisation and liberalism and this sort of thing. And it's just backwards Britain that, that's missing out on that. Uh, and it's nonsense. Uh, they are local manifestations of a global pro- process. And so when I see people, there's a whole instinct now in parts of the kind of centre left, liberally tight left, uh, and and some people who are who are more left wing but are kind of drawn into the orbit of that. I've sort of pressed the reset button. Go back. There is no going back, yeah. and deglobalisation will continue whether it takes the form of leaving the EU or not. Yeah. Um, and so we have to, we have to uh, sort of steal ourselves to the reality of that situation, and use some of the traditional forms of analysis that the left used to deploy, because some of the forms of analysis that you see about the world now, it's pure culture war rhetoric. I mean, like this stuff about. Brexit is caused by British exceptionalism and British nationalism. Now, of course, there are elements of those things in play, but the left traditionally had more powerful forms of analysis that could point to the real material realities of the world, things like imperialism. I think what's, and one of the things that I've been fascinated by about Brexit is the longer this crisis within the British state has ran for, the more deep that the crisis has got is it's almost like that Veli ideology, and think of it in terms of Louis Althusser's Veli mm. ideology, which mm. is the stories we tell ourselves about our lives and the country we live in, from school to family to political parties. Are, but of course, as Althusser said, it's no, us, it's no helping us recognise mm-hmm. the world as it really is. It's yep. a misrecognition. Mm-hmm. And that veil through this crisis has almost been pulled back. Yeah, yeah. And people can see mm. that actually mm-hmm. this is a farce. Yeah, absolutely. this is a farce. And what we see are these competing classes, economic interests at play, and also global capital at play. Mm-hmm. And though you can see the, the forces who were on the hard right trying to push for that empire 2.0 have been humiliated mm-hmm. to the point it isn't even clear what the ERG or the DUP or what way they're going to nobody seems to know one day or the next what, what they're going to do in terms mm-hmm. of who they're going to vote for or what. But what we've seen is that the 33 million people voting a referendum. That doesn't matter anymore. Mm. Now it comes down to whether he's 650 people in Westminster yeah. who are overwhelmingly in favour of the global economy because they are overwhelmingly the winners of the global economy mm-hmm. and it's what they decide. Yeah. And if you go out and speak to people in communities, I'm amazed. People are way ahead of the left on this. Yeah. People can see mm-hmm. this is a farce. Like. Yeah. I, I mean, I find it incredible that people keep saying X, Y and Z cannot or even should not happen in this situation because of parliamentary arithmetic. Well, parliamentary arithmetic is another way of saying class power. It's it's totally obvious. And it takes two sort of forms. Um, one is, as you say, the, the, the MPs themselves are typically from wealthier backgrounds, or certainly many, many more of them as a percentage, you know, come from wealthy backgrounds in the general population. And then you hear constant invocations in the House of Commons of the national interest. The national interest is the interest of rich people. And they are some of them very consciously support the interests of rich people. Some of them, for example, on the, on the Labour benches or on the Lib Dem benches or the, the SNP benches, um, will say national interest because it's in the zeitgeist and imagine that that's a real thing, that there is a single unitary interest in this country, as, you know, a single outcome to this uh, constitutional crisis, which will equally benefit everyone. Uh, and it's, I mean, that is, as you point out, it's pure ideology. That's a, it's a, it's a, a total, you know, fairy story version of reality. And you're quite right as well to say, I mean, the the right is, uh, it's having its ideological understanding of the world grossly undermined by the Brexit process. It's something that's so strange about, from the very start of the referendum campaign, there were people saying right-wing ideology will explode as a hegemonic force right across society when the Brexit vote vote happens. All of the assumptions of right-wing politics have been hideously undermined since the start of this process. There used to be people on the right of the Tory party who thought that Brexit would reunify a very fractured uh, uh, you know, British nationalism, sense of British nationalism. Do people feel in Scotland feel more British 
you know, than at the start of this process. The people, you know, in Northern Ireland who wouldn't have felt British at the start of the Brexit process, do they feel more British now? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm willing to guess that the answer to that question is absolutely not. So it's important not to take them at their word. They don't know what they're talking about. I think this is this is what happens when when a left has faced defeats for decades and decades, is that they start to imagine that their en- enemies are omnipotent. You know, Thatcher, the invocation of Thatcher is this, you know, this sort of ruling class Lenin who is all powerful and is in charge of, uh, of the whole kind of state of the country. The people we are up against in the Tory party are not Thatcher and they are not omnipotent. They're a complete shambles. Um, and yes, and, 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 and then on the other hand, I'm complete, there's a, I'm very concerned that there's, a mystification. I mean, that's somehow sometimes how Marx described the process of ideology, or the way people ideologize economic relationships in society. Um, the the left seems to have imbibed a great deal of mystification about how the state operates and about how the parliament operates. Anyone who's read history, and we were talking um, uh, before we started here about the importance of history to a left wing analysis. Anyone who's read history knows that history does not happen by parliamentary arithmetic. Um, the parliament is a vulnerable institution. It's a weak institution. It's a derided institution in the country. The last thing that people who want radical change in this country should be doing is standing behind parliament and saying, well, I might like a general election, but I don't know there's parliamentary arithmetic for it. Um, I have to say I'm a bit confused as to why... Labour with half a million members aren't camping thousands of people outside the parliament every day mm. demanding a general election. I'm utterly confused by that state of affairs. Um, but that confusion is widespread. Uh, if you look at what people on the left are saying, there's no agreement on the next step forward, which is so obviously a general election. And the easiest thing to call for and to ag- agitate uh, for in the world. But you'll, you know, people talk about it as though. It's just a chaotic thing that will come down in the end to parliamentary arithmetic and we just have to stand by and watch that happen. And I agree with you that um, this is this is repeatedly in history. There have been times when people who imagine themselves to have a very radical understanding of the world fall way behind the broad layers uh, of working class society in their understanding of events. This is clearly one of those times um, I, I, just just to, to give kind of three pieces of empirical evidence for that, you have a country where 13 million people voted for uh, the most left-wing, I mean in his own personal politics, not necessarily the politics he's putting forward, the most left-wing uh, leader of the Labour Party there has ever been, a, whose major policy platform is nationalisation of key utilities and stuff like that. The support for the key, for the nationalisation of rail and water and so on, has never been higher in in modern times. And this is also the same electorate who voted to leave a European Union which would forbid this government from introducing those very policies. Now, I'm not saying that there's a complete coherent understanding in British society across everyone who's, who's voting for those positions. But that is a picture in general of a country ready for change. And it's the left which, after all of those examples of a a popular impulse towards social change, is saying, stop, stop all the change that's happening. It's scary, it's dangerous, it's really dangerous, and it's it's unleashing unhealthy um, attitudes in British society. And there's something else, and you mentioned Parliament there, there's something else that's been going on, and I've noticed that, I've been saying to people for the last few weeks, that, and I heard it said on the BBC, I think it was Andrew Neil said it on the BBC last night, explicitly, which is that our system works and it works because Parliament is on the news every night and people are watching Parliament every night. So <laughs> that shows and look at like Jeremy Corbyn speaking to Theresa May and all, there's, there we're not got any of the problems Francis go like yeah. everything's working fine here. Now, I can understand that for the BBC I can understand that for the ruling class I can understand the Tories trying to keep that message mm-hmm. going but what I didn't understand is why the Labour Party or nationalist parties Rather than, as you say, using this opportunity when the state is at its weakest Mm -hmm. to push for change, real radical change that's going to improve people's lives economically, rather than that, 
they're playing these sort of parliamentary games as well about how clever was my motion compared to that motion and how clever is this trick we can play in Parliament if we get together with this lot in Parliament. And then they come on the TV with big grins on their faces, totally proud of themselves for the latest fiasco. They have no idea, I don't think, how ordinary people are viewing them. And yeah. the damage they are doing to the institutions that they seem to love so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it is fascinating, and it's all obviously. I mean, in, on, in Corbyn's behalf. Now, Corbyn's not omnipotent; he can't organise a mass street movement or or whatever when he's in the position he's in. But I, I, I don't understand why the Labour left is determined to play its weakest hand over and over again. Um, the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, are mainly the same gaggle of careerists uh, who believe in nothing that they have been these last few decades. Trying to use that as the force that tails down the Tory party. I I don't understand when you've got armies, hundreds of thousands of activists all over the country, many of whom, and we see this same situation in Scotland, where the base of the independence movement is much more radical and much more prepared for a confrontation than the leadership is. That's also true in the Labour Party. The membership, by and large, is much more confrontational, much more determined to push through their vision of the country. And I don't I don't understand why it's not being uh, used. And, in fact, the only demonstrations that have been in London uh, in recent months in support of a general election have mainly been organised by forces outside of the Labour mm. Party. So I, I don't understand... Uh, that that situation and the only mass mobilisation in which left Labour MPs left Labour MPs uh, have gotten involved is uh, the uh, People's Vote mm. march uh, on which parts of, of the left organised uh, a, a mobilisation and it's just I mean that that's precisely the type of mobilisation that the left in this period, I think, does not want to be associated with. When we could have had um, a, a much more militant uh, push representing the sorts of politics that people in the country, I think, are very concerned about. Not to say that people aren't worried about the general Brexit chaos, but the fundamental stuff that's going on in this society is the same stuff that's been going on for years. Uh, uh, there was a new study out by the Bureau for Investigative uh, journalism that showed that I think it's something like 9.2 billion worth of council property has been sold off in the last four years, um, and rather than foreground the left's own message about wealth redistribution, about the redemocratisation of society and its institutions and so forth, parts of the left are allowing themselves to be led by someone else's agenda, by another class force's agenda. Uh, by a section of the ruling class, which is essentially determined to restore order in a very disorderly situation. That should never be the left's perspective. The the left's perspective should be to use the disorder to advance its own unique independent political position. And I I think that may be a useful point to, and we can maybe come back to it, but to decouple the left, Mm -hmm. however we're describing that, from the working class. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, the only... March that the the left in any sizable numbers took part in was the People's Vote March. The only march that the working class took part in in this period has been the Leave March that was organised. Mm. I think it was two of the Leave Marches. One was obviously the far right one with UKIP, and there was the other one which was Leave means Leave or whatever. But there was clearly a a, a very significant working class presence on that march that there hadn't been on the People's Vote March or any other ones. Uh, so I mean I think that tells us something interesting as well. Mm. There is a huge vacuum in working class communities and there has been for a long time, but it's got nothing to do with Brexit, it's just mm. exacerbated it, but it's been there for a long time, as social democratic parties like Labour, and as again, this is something we can talk about France, it's the same with Democrats in the United States, as their parties have become more and more aligned with the global economy and with the dominant classes, there is a vacuum in working class communities. Now, Brexit is almost perfectly set up for the right and the far right to take advantage of that mm-hmm. if progressive anti-fascist forces in working class communities didn't get back together fairly quickly mm-hmm. and I think the absence of working class people on that People's Hope March and the presence of them in such significant numbers on the Leave March shows that there is a potential for that coming down the pipeline quite quickly. So what are, to, what are we to make of any how Brexit the crisis the terrible way the political class are handling it and also the really disrespectful way we're speaking about working class people, mm-hmm, particularly those who voted leave. Mm-hmm. 
what are we making at? Because it's almost like you're trying to antagonise working class people by telling them they're too stupid to understand what they were voting for, mm. or they're all racists or mm. fascists. Or, I mean, this is what happened in France. And now Front National have got like millions and millions of voters. There isn't millions and millions of fascists there. Like, yeah, There's yeah. working class people who are fed up with the dominant classes talking mm-hmm. to them like they're stupid. Yeah. I, would, I mean, this seems to be being replicated here. It's very dangerous. I think it is. And I mean... The thing I think we have to remember about about the left in this country, which I mean, it's it's difficult to talk about our left um, because that's such a an expansive idea now. It's too broad a concept in many regards. But even if you if you you know people who say that they're socialists or they want that type of transformation in uh, in British society, like the ones who joined the the People's Vote march, you have to remember that like. Uh, over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, uh, the working class has taken a real kick in in this country. It lost a lot of its organisational capacity. And it was part of that process that the left became increasingly detached from uh, the, the organised working class and the working class in general as a, as a mainly inevitable consequence of that um, project by Thatcher and, and successors. Um, I mean, I always think it's remarkable that the people who campaigned against Britain joining the EEC were the left of the Labour Party, the Communist Party, trade union lefts, those sorts of people. The reason isn't that Michael Foote, for example, who campaigned for um, it not to join the EEC, is some sort of hard bitten class warrior, right? Who who really understands you know class politics? I mean, he was an upper middle class intellectual literary figure. But he had to respond to the rea- to a reality, which was that he was rooted in a labour movement, which educated him, which informed him, and most importantly gave him the self-confidence to pursue a radical position that was oppositional to the mainstream of the ruling class um, position. I dare say if Michael Foote were around today, I don't want, I mean, he's not around to defend himself, so I don't want to guess the position he'd take, but I could well imagine that he would have been on that People's Vote March. And the difference is a loss of confidence in the working class as an actor of progress in society. And whether people can admit it or not, I think there's a significant portion of left-wing opinion that basically views the working class as a slightly dangerous and threatening thing that can turn in a heartbeat to the far right. And that can, as you say, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're, if you're keeping the broad layers of British society at arm's length for fear that they will become that this monstrous incarnation of fascism or whatever, um, you're setting yourself up for precisely that scenario. And I agree that that's a very frightening... And the, and the breakdown in any kind of organic relationship between parts of the kind of left-wing intelligentsia and the working class, to which, you know, there has been a, there has historically been a, um, a, a, coal, a coalition of those sorts of forces. I mean, radical politics is quite often that... Um, the breakdown of that coalition and and the refusal of parts of that intelligentsia to to reconsider that that fusing of interests or to work on that is of course a very dangerous problem. I mean, I would say that there have been some attempts by 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 forces on the left to, um, uh, for example, if we're just talking about London marches, there was a a general election now march um, that tried to galvanise, you know. People from the Labour Party, for example, who are in that membership that I'm talking about, the wider uh, forces of the left, that whatever its opinion on Leave and Remain, because of course there are many working class people who voted Remain as sure, well, absolutely. Um, but who, who said, uh, you know, in that march, however you voted on that, you must agree that a general election where all things are now considered, not just constitutional issues, but foreign policy, the economy, austerity, etc. Um, and so an effort was made in that direction, but yes, the general picture is one where, um, where, where the sort of people's vote, a world where it's the people's vote versus Farage, is a terrifying situation because the radical content of the political situation is lost. And frankly, I'm not convinced that people like Farage won't ultimately win that fight. And they can win it in one of two ways. They can win it by, well, the way Trump won it, which was quite simply to beat his to beat the liberal centre, uh, or someone like Salvini achieved, or someone like Viktor Orban achieved. There's another way that the, the far right can win as well, 
which is that the Liberal Centre is incredibly willing to move towards the right's positions. Um, so, for example, if you look at Macron, uh, he has adopted an authoritarian nationalist mm. style to try and head off the Front National. But in a sense, that means the Front National is already, already winning. It's already d- twisting and distorting the political culture in its direction. It's not often commented on, but the people who were on that platform, um, like Tony Blair, like Nick Clegg, like Anna Soubry, all these uh, chancellors, who like to present themselves as the face of liberal internationalism, first of all, they all supported, of course, hideous acts of you know international crimes, warfare and so on. But the demands that they're actually putting to the European Union such as they're putting any, because in reality they just want to rejoin the European Union. But the way that they say that they're going to sell this in a second referendum is that they'll move to the right. They'll start demanding um, uh, more policies to restrict immigration. They'll start demanding... um, There's no talk of democratising the EU. There's no talk of making the EU something which is less neoliberal. The reforms that they claim, you know, there's this slogan, remain and reform. Mm-hmm. Well, all the reforms that are actually being proposed from the main forces here are to move the union in a right-wing direction, to kind of Macronize it. And Macron's, he's an interesting figure, much more interesting than I think a lot of people give him credit, because he represents the only response that liberalism is ever likely to mount to the rise of the European far right, which is nationalism, authoritarianism, uh, and not just in rhetoric or legislation. I mean, you know, there are dozens of people who have been mutilated mm. on those marches, lost eyes, lost hands, yep. lost legs, all kinds of stuff. We don't even know. Um, uh, such, by the way, is the, is the extent of media repression. I mean, how much reportage is there uh, in Britain these days that our country next door is a few steps away from civil war? Um, so... Yeah, I mean, it represents. I mean, the, 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 if you, but if the left wants to go the way of that sort of culture war, that's the situation you're going to end up with: increasingly authoritarian, uh, nationalist centre versus an emboldened far right, and that's the situation you have in France. And obviously, with Merkel being on the on the road out. Macron's vision of the EU is the one that's most dominant at the moment, and that is more integration mm. to actually speed up the process. So rather than recognising there's a problem, he wants to put the foot down, like let's yeah. advance it quicker. And that, as you say, is what the people's vote. People are really in favour of all the reforms are the ones that Macron and the global economy would like, mm. and they're all ones that would be detrimental to the working class. Yeah. And you mentioned one other thing there, which I think uh, was immigration. And immigration is one of the, it's probably the most difficult issue, I think, for the left to discuss. Mm. In the sense, if you discuss it with the left, it tends to be a discussion about how quickly they can change the subject or, mm-hmm. or, yeah. or say it's a, it's a false question or something. But I've got a real issue with the way that the EU has been portrayed by the people who voted Remain or who are in favour of getting back in or staying mm-hmm. in, which is that they seem to be saying, like, the EU is this great, lovely, liberal place with open borders and people can come and go as they like and freedom of movement is this fantastic thing. Whereas in truth, the EU is very racialised mm-hmm. and if you, you only have to see the people that are dying in the Mediterranean. Yeah. You only have to look at what's happening in the Balkan countries or in Italy. You see, the idea of there's no borders is f- plainly ridiculous. Yeah. Right? So we really need to talk about the issue of immigration mm-hmm. in a much more thoughtful way I think yeah. we, need to, we need to try and reframe the debate and somebody sent me something yesterday which was a, I can't even remember who it was but it was a member of his staff of the SNP who would put something out saying all oh, these terrible people supporting Brexit because they all they don't like immigrants and mm-hmm. we are pro-immigration mm-hmm. was what he said in the other tweet for the SNP but you need to we were talking about it and said you need to stop and think about that you're pro-immigration so what you're pro-workers the other parts of the world having to come here and live in poor housing mm. and work in poor conditions what, so they can drive your Ubers or they can nanny your children for you. 30 years ago, somebody saying something like that, that we'd have been saying, they've exploited foreign workers. Mm. Now these people are patting themselves on the back and saying, oh, no, we love migrants. and We love. We need to really reframe this whole discussion. Mm-hmm. And it has to be around about the, the basis of class. And there's an, there's an idea about nomadic 
proletarian mm. who's now being forced to move around an interest of global capital, mm. which is a much more progressive way of thinking about it, rather than we love migrants, it's yeah. migrants and immigrants. Because they say these these are labels which they not suit. These mm-hmm. are working class people we're talking about. Yeah. So we need to figure out a way to integrate in the questions. I mean, the scheme I live in, it's probably over half the people live there are immigrants, yeah. by which I mean they've came they born somewhere else and came here obviously myself my family are immigrants as yeah. well but they're born somewhere and come here over half of them so when we talk about people in the in the community having concerns about issues mm-hmm. we mean the multiracial multi-ethnic multi-religious working yeah. class we Absolutely. didn't mean white yeah. but now if you raise working class people say oh you mean white people yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. and it's interesting because it's these liberal lefty types who say that mm-hmm. and they're the ones that are racialising the question yeah. when I talk about the working class I mean I mean them all yeah and and it's interesting that one of the things that the contemporary left thinks it's very hot on is race and racism as an issue. Actually, I think that um, again, because of the because of the material weaknesses of of the socialist left in this period, because of the um, the, the the attacks on the working class in recent decades, this is one of those areas where large parts of the socialist left sort of sluice into the slipstream of liberalism and, and they discuss immigration as a liberal issue rather than as as you say as, as a as a class issue um it's i think it's a complex one it's a complex debate that socialists have to have with themselves i mean there's a few things that a way a friend put this to me recently was there's something that most you know, that no one on the left or the right wants to admit which is that modern capitalism doesn't function without large amounts of migration Um, the right don't want to admit it because they want, big businesses want migration, they want uh, things like the institution of free movement, which as you say is not free movement, it's it's a racialised immigration policy, but they want that to service their industries however, right wing politics can only defend business interests when it bases it on chauvinism and nationalism and and, and so on so they can't admit that Um, large parts of the left um, want to maintain a, a, a kind of liberal orientation on immigration and don't want to discuss its class dimensions um, because they see that as a vulgarisation. I don't know why, for example, it's difficult for some on the left to admit the empirical fact that immigration is used sometimes to drive down wages. Uh, I mean, there are numerous studies that show you it's not it's not a general thing. Wages haven't fallen UK wide because of uh, immigration in in the last uh, decade or fifteen years, when there was quite a large amount of migration from Eastern Europe, for example. But in certain trades, in certain parts of the economy, clearly employers used migration flows to drive down wages and, and conditions. And that's the important part, by the way. Employers used the way that they always use divisions within the working class or perceived divisions to drive down wages. Now, the the difficulty for the left is, of course, what Theresa May is proposing as an alternative to so-called free movement. And it's worth saying at this point, as you're saying, most migrants who come to Britain are not from the EU. And it's it's quite interesting now to see people say, well, you're the anti-immigrant passing because you're threatening the institution of of, of the the European Union. I don't remember uh, a great demand on parts of the left to secure free movement for people who came from outside of Europe Mm. before before the whole Brexit thing happens. But the the problem is that the solution offered, of course, by the right, this points-based system, is itself designed to push down wages, to use immigration to push down wages. Ultimately... The only way to address this situation is with the measures that the left is lacking in this period, which is the self-organisation of the working class. The only ultimate way to defeat um, downward pressures on wages, the way that's used by the bosses and by the state, is to have trade union organisation, to have community organisation, as you say, to, to, to fight off, to fend off the, the, the far right. And that's what we're lacking. But the wrong way to pursue that problem is to defend any of the ruling class's answers. Is 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 to say, well, um, I almost think with this, by the way, people think there's no way that you could have uh, that you could establish, uh, uh, you know, the the free movement institution we have now through support from the population in Britain. So let's support the EU bureaucrats in what they are doing. 
and you just think, I mean, that it's a cop out yeah. apart from anything else. And uh, any victory won on uh, so called won on the basis that for now it's in the ruling class's interest to have that particular type of institutionalised racist immigration policy is easily lost and easily manipulated by forces on the far right to their own gain. Yeah. And I think the, the other... This is, and it is a really complicated question and it is a really difficult question and there's no simple yeah. answers to it or would have come up with them by now. So we do, in many ways, we're experimenting. We're trying to think through these problems mm-hmm. and trying to rethink them and trying to come to some position which will help advance the working class collectively. And it seems to me that we need to be thinking about it in terms of how do we integrate the foreign working class people who are here into our community organisations or political structures or whatever it is so as they didn't become or oh, they're the migrants that mm. we love and we've got to look after. Like yeah, yeah. We need to be making sure that actually they're very much part of what it is we're trying to do. And that means involving them in the decision-making mm-hmm. processes, listen to what they're saying. And that's the bit the left are never good at because they don't like listening to working class at all, mm. never mind whether they're born here or born somewhere else. So that's the bit we need to change. We need to start from the bottom up. And the other thing about it, I think, is about left strategy. If we're going to combat the right with all their false solutions to these problems, mm-hmm. then when they go into working class areas and people are complaining about bad housing, about the fact they can't get their, their kid on the housing list, about the fact maybe they can't get on the doctor's register or a dentist or cuts to pensioners' mm-hmm. clubs. So people have got all these problems and the far right come in and say, oh, it's because there's too many there's too many uh, immigrants here. Mm-hmm. But for the left, what we need to do is develop a strategy which has, gets us beyond that question mm-hmm. when we even work in class communities. Because mm-hmm. it's all right people sitting around the intelligentsia, as we talk about, but mm-hmm. it's all right these people sitting around saying, oh, no, what we need is more immigration. We need to be pro-immigration. We need to... But they didn't live in these communities. You mm-hmm. know, the people in Edinburgh who are most in favour, they keep talking about diversity, these are people who are self-segregated, mm-hmm. living in the wealthy parts of Edinburgh. So when they talk about multiculturalism and they talk about more immigration and they talk about diversity, they didn't mean for them. The yeah. need for the working class. Mm-hmm. So what we need to do as working class people is organise ourselves, all of us, mm-hmm. in that multi-ethnic, multi-racial group of people mm-hmm. that we are, and organise ourselves in our own interests. And that has to be part of a broader left strategy for combating the far right in communities, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, no, I, I, I think, like, I, I mean, it's sort of a, a cliche, perhaps, of, of sort of Marxist political thought, but I do think that questions political questions start from a class perspective. I don't I don't see that the, there's much of a future on the left of amalgamating together a series of eclectic positions taken from different class forces. And I agree with you, by the way, that actually immigration is an issue is one very underexplored by the left in recent years. Easy answers have been sought, um, which typically do not come from a class origin uh, of thought. I mean, I remember incidentally um, uh, reading a pamphlet by a socialist group that actually argued that um, the current immigration regime was a good thing because it increases GDP. And I just thought, how just <laughs> how how completely disconnected mm. from reality has that been? And the, and the the sad thing about refusing to take the issue seriously. Is, is that forces, first the BNP, then groups like the EDL, uh, and to an extent then UKIP, have run amok with this issue. Yeah. And it has helped to underthinking uh, strategic issues for, the, for the, the socialist movement always leads to, the, to the, the creation of these problems where so, the, so elements like the, the EDL would gain a foothold over elements of the working class or in, in some working class communities. And the response of the left, there again, once again, perhaps described in the left as you know too too broad a, a, a concept, is to scream racist. Um, and I think there's a misunderstanding of, you know, condescension and moralism is a big part of the intellectual economy of class relations. Uh, this is something that in my lifetime, the left has. I, I, some parts of the left have become truly infected with a, a politics of moral condemnation, of quite casual condemnation that goes all over the place, directed at society, 
directed at whole groups of people in society, directed at the left itself, a, a constant self cannibalization round after round of uh, casual condemnation. It's so easy to do now, you know, with social media and stuff like that as well. Um, much of which I think is childish at best and self destructive at worst. I mean, I, I have, like everyone else, you know, I'll giggle uh, a, a meme about baby boomers or gamins or whatever. But let's be honest, it's pathetic stuff. It's not politically serious. Um, and there's almost a determination in some circles to alienate large parts of the population. And I think it's extremely toxic. Uh, and, and, you know, someone um, reminded me the other day that you know the left used to dismiss all this stuff about political correctness? as if, Well, it's just a concept invented by the right. And of course, up to a certain point, it is. The right, is, the right loves to, to sort of create culture war ideas of, of that kind. Um, but I think that political correctness is actually a real phenomenon. And I think it's rooted in class relations. So, uh, exhoring, examining, for example, like Victorian class relations is fascinating in this regard. Um so uh, there's been a lot of writing now about now about you know the new Victorians and how we're a generation of kind of new Victorians in, in, in the way that we interact on a class basis. Victorians established a whole series of moral codes, um, the, the Victorian middle class did, and lifestyle habits, tourism, exercise, actually, was, it was initially a way that the middle class could say, I have enough money that I don't need to work and I can go to the park and mm. exercise. Um, but that extended to a whole whole areas of social life of of what was considered you know acceptable and unacceptable and so on to quite a considerable degree i mean there's some senses in which political correctness is well intentioned um if that is indeed a thing political correctness it's a series of well intentioned behaviors about trying to alleviate oppressive attitudes or whatever to a much more considerable degree it's about class differentiation um it's about middle class people being able to identify each other as middle class by the verbal cues that they use, yeah. by the, the, the table manners they have, and so on. And it's very much about dis- dissociating ourselves from um, you know, the mob out there uh, who, don't, who don't have our etiquette, who don't understand. They're not as sophisticated. Yeah. You know? uh, and, I, and I worry about the, the impact of that culture on the left and its ability to re- reforge links with a wider working class from which we've become detached. And tell me... What's your sense, any, how all of this, what we're talking about, Brexit, the crisis, um, these global forces, but also, I would say, a, pretty much a crisis on the left, how is that going to play in Scotland? Where are we in terms of independence? Because there's a, there's a huge debate going on within the independence movement, if I, can, if, if I can call it that, between people who want an independence referendum now, mm. probably already mm-hmm. think it should have been held, and the SNP leadership who seem to take a much more cautious position which seems to be trying to part with that people's vote thing, try to save the state from itself mm-hmm. as opposed to try to break the state apart when it's at its weakest. So how do you think all of this is going to play out and as we move forward? So I think that the leadership of the SNP have entered a, a grim and fascinating um, strategy which is, I mean I think of it as independence by deep globalisation. So we were talking earlier about how globalisation is in crisis now. Um, the leadership of the SNP appears not to have noticed this at all. Uh, in fact, Nicola Sturgeon's rhetoric uh, around what Scotland is and what independence represents in the world has become more and more a caricature of sort of 1997 Tony Blair as time has gone on. As the state of global politics uh, continues along a line of uh, you know, um, polarisation, the rise of populism, so-called kind of a nebulous concept, but, you know, politics is fragmenting away from the, the liberal certainties of the sort of late 90s up to the kind of uh, the banking crisis and after um, period, the more and more determined the SNP leadership has become to invest Scottish independence in an idea that's dying. I mean, what's interesting in Scotland is that... Um, the constitutional issue here has sort of frozen in time the decay that's taking place in almost every other European country. This is one of the things that I find so enjoyable about some of the nonsense that's spoken about Europe. And that is well, by the way, 
people in like Scotland and England, middle class people, have always thought that there's a great, you know, nirvana just outside mm. this island in Europe, in France, where they have a wonderful cuisine in Norway, where it's heaven on earth and all this kind of stuff. That's a, that's a long hang up. It's a total nonsense. If you look at European politics today, the frightening reality in some ways is that uh, British politics is, I mean, it's a polarised situation, but it's quite far to the left of where politics is in most other major European countries. In most other major European countries, there's no social democratic party to speak of. They have disintegrated. I mean, in France and Germany, they are just husks. It's pathetic. And the right is in charge, and the far right is the opposition. In Britain, you still have a situation where the centre-right is in charge. There's a significant far-right fringe, but it's struggling to cohere into something coherent at the moment. And uh, a much more coherent left social democratic politics is in charge in a mass membership left-wing party. That's a unique situation in Europe. But to listen to lots of people in in the leadership of the uh, SNP, Britain is an unmitigated right-wing hellhole uh, and what we need to do is join love, the rest of the kind of lovely liberal world uh, where everyone's terribly cosmopolitan. Um, it's a total fantasy. But the way that this is actually being pursued is to sort of achieve independence by parceling away all of that country's sovereignty. So that's what NATO... I mean, this is a longer-run process than just the current leadership, but it's accelerated under the current leadership. We'll parcel away our foreign policy to NATO. We'll parcel away our trade and other you know, governments and other economic policy to the European Union uh, and we'll uh, parcel away now our monetary policy to a remaining UK state. We're actually proposing to leave a UK state and give it powers over our economy. I cannot fathom uh, the logic of that. I think in some circles this is considered a sort of clever act of dialectics. We'll become technically politically independent by giving up all our independence to model and fashion the society that emerges after independence. Now, I don't think it's clever. Uh, I think it will... uh, I think it will result in disaster. In fact, what I actually think it will result in is that... And what that strategy tells me is that the SNP leadership, I think at the moment, has little intention of pursuing independence in the short to medium term. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some... uh, there'll be some a vast outcome to the whole Brexit constitutional crisis and people will say, uh, no, we actually do have a chance here. I suspect that the, S, the, the leading faction in the SNP is bedding down, tr- going for a long game. I mean, they're doing things, for example, like setting up offices in Berlin. So I think they perhaps imagine that um, the world will sort of move back into that globalisation thing. Uh, Britain will be heading away from it and Scotland will start heading towards it. Unfortunately, I think that completely misunderstands British politics, global politics, Scottish politics, um, the entire situation. And the working class uh, base of the independence movement, I think, is just becoming increasingly frustrated. There's a difficulty, which is that, partly because of the experience of 2014 and 2013 as well, I suppose, the campaign then, where everyone, we were all in the independence movement together and we were constantly under constant attack from the media, from the British political elite and so on. Um, That wedded people together and I think that large parts of the independence movement don't want to have an all-out critique of the the, the leadership uh, uh, of the SNP because they see them as our team and heading up our team in in that situation. And I think it's a problem because... For example, at the forthcoming SNP conference, there ought to be a serious confrontation over the currency issue. Perhaps there will be. I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult for me to gauge. I know that six branches have put forward an amendment uh, calling for the, the six tests it's about, okay, to be removed from the currency. Those are basically tests that would stop an independent <laughs> Scottish yeah. currency ever coming into existence in, a, in an independent state. Um so, yeah, I, I think it's a difficult situation. I don't want to say how I think it will, you know, I don't want to, it's terrible to make pr- predictions yeah, no, no, in let's, this. Let's <laughs> not make predictions, or come back and haunt us. But, uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because the, this this issue around the, the SNP, sort of softly, softly strategy, if I can uh, put it like that. I mean, we've had some trouble in the past by, or I've had some trouble in the past by sort of suggesting that what they're in favour is closer to Dominion status mm-hmm. than independence. 
And my reasoning for that was, if you look at what are crucial state powers, like heady state, like control of the economy, controlling military, hard power, soft power, the SNP have already conceded all that stuff. Like they want to keep the Queen as a heady state, they want to give currency control to the Bank of England. They're um, they're already talking about you know, Scottish regiments staying in the British Army, and they'll use like have joint security services and that. So, so in terms of like they're not in any interest to confront the state or to break the state up. They just mm. want to come to some sort of accommodation with the state where they'll shift certain government departments and functions from London to Edinburgh mm. and change the flags. Now, that's, so that's been a sort of longer-term problem, but I think you're right, philosophically, there's a problem with this, which is that, now, it, c- it can often be portrayed as, in particular in the case of like Trump or whatever, as sort of isolationist policies, but there's something there about sovereignism and this, this idea of sovereignty and how that is wedded and it's seen at the moment as being a really sort of right wing mm-hmm. idea mm-hmm. but of course the left historically have, have had a, a big stake in that as well mm-hmm. and that does seem to be the sort of general direction of movements that are growing up particularly across the EU as you say and the SNP seem to be swimming against the tide of that yeah. strangely enough like mm-hmm. they're, they're sort of, and, and it seems to be this really sort of and I'm, I, I'm sure some of them have got more sophisticated view it than this but I speak to a lot of people when you ask them and it's like well England voted to leave we voted to remain That's just a bit, that seems to be about the simple fact mm-hmm. of the matter and I think well we didn't just always want to be doing what the opposite England does like it's not like politics are a bit more complicated than that mm-hmm. now that's not to undermine the argument that there's a democratic deficit there yeah, clearly yeah. is a democratic deficit yeah. Scotland did vote to remain the rest of the UK voted well for the North voted to remain as well. But so people did vote to remain in Scotland mm. and there should have been an independence referendum. Yeah. Which they could have put the question, do you want to re- remain in the EU and be independent? The fact that they never done that seems to me really yeah. odd. And they had all that political capital after the two thousand and fifteen election when they got all the MPs elected. They did absolutely nothing with that political capital either. I mean mm. I said to the people at the time in the in the SNP You've got to take that for a spin. You've got so much. You've got so much power there, yeah. and instead they went on holiday for three months. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was quite an amazing, strange thing to do when you're at that moment. Then we've got Brexit again. That sort of strength of position has dissipated, and they've now got involved in all these parliamentary games going on about how yeah. they can thwart Brexit and all the rest of it. It seems to me really strange, and there is there seems to me to be something around about it which is very runs counter. Mm-hmm what independence movements would be, particularly against these big colonial states. Yeah, and uh, I mean, th- there's a strange thing in, in, in the world today where, I mean, of course, the, the colonial states is the kind of opposite point there because if you think about the history of national movements, if you think about in Africa or you think in Ireland or many national movements around the world, there was a clear cut, you know, independence couldn't wait because of the nature of uh, the colonial relationship that existed, the extraction of wealth, the oppression of people, and so on. Modern nationalist movements in within the kind of uh, imperial metropole, as they say, in, in the powerful dominant parts of the world, there's not that same dynamic, making it kind of strange to me that there are elements, you know, people like Andrew Wilson, who want independence, want to affect the status quo. I suspect, I suspect there's an element of the Scottish elite and the Scottish middle class and, and upper middle class and so on, who feel carved out of influence in the state and society. But I wonder how great the commitment to actual an, a, a ruptural break with the state actually is. I suspect not at all. And there are two kind of models that emerge out of that. One is Quebec, where there will always be a demand for independence, but there don't seem to be, well, for example, the main kind of right wing, uh, the main kind of centre, uh, Quebec party, there doesn't seem to be any serious interest in bringing about even a referendum or anything like that. It's just something that they use to define themselves against the Canadian state and call for the devolution of more power and, and stuff like that, and it just goes on forever. Um, the different strategy is Catalonia, which is an interesting thing because that was not going to win. But what going for that vote in Catalonia has ensured is that the national movement will survive for another generation. Now, if I was in the SNP leadership's boots and I was serious about independence, I would say we can do Catalonia, we can do Quebec. Uh, Now, of course, it's the case that Theresa May will just, or whoever replaces her, will just say now is not the time, right? Fine. But then you turn it into the kind of movement they had in Catalonia, street movement, agitational movement, 
you really put pressure on the state. Uh, you use direct action, as one um, former SNP MP, George Kerebin, has said, in the campaign of direct action. That's that's what national independence looks like now. It doesn't look like a parliamentary or constitu- purely constitutional process anymore. And you make a demand for a referendum on that basis. But the thing that, I mean, going back to that People's Vote March, I found just absolutely astonishing, was that Nicola Sturgeon will go on that march, but she has refused to go on any of the very large pro-independence marches in Scotland. I mean, the one in Edinburgh, I don't know if it was 100,000, it's difficult to, to count, but it was certainly a massive march, a gigantic march. And uh, Nicola Sturgeon at the conference uh, a couple of days later said, you need to be patient, you need to be patient and pragmatic. And I just, I, I cannot fathom that. You won't go on the marches of your own national movement that you are, that you lead, uh, but you will go down to London which is right outside your door. I mean, she's in a beautiful <laughs> house here in Edinburgh. She won't go out a hundred yards and meet the people who are marching, um, but she will go all the way down to London to go on a platform with uh, people. People, by the way, who are part of the reason that there was an independence movement. People like Alistair Campbell are part of the reason there was an independence movement in this country uh, after twenty twelve because people were so sick of New Labour. It's such a disgusting. Uh, development uh, and felt that there was no opposition anymore inside uh, the UK to unite with them to call on something which would undoubtedly undermine the independence movement if there were a, a, a vote to ratify or a people's vote uh, uh, leaders of the uh, people's vote campaign have already said that would be the precedent set for Scotland so if there was an independence vote it would have to seek uh, there would ne- then need to be negotiations and then a second vote, which of course would mean that the British state would be incentivised to give us nothing <laughs> and then say you're going to crash out with an no deal, now have another vote. And all of that time, the large part of the Scottish population who will vote no will be given money to organise for that second plebiscite uh, and to undermine the independence vote. So, uh, yeah, it's extremely... that 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 move for me summed up the strange direction uh, of the SNP leadership, and so just the the time we've got left. What I'm interested in, we don't we don't know. We'll not we'll no predict how that yeah. how that's going to go either. Let's not make any <laughs> predictions at all. That's easy as well. Yeah. But however, the SNP choose to play it. There, it seems to me that there's going to be a second independence referendum or there's going to be a push for it, there's going to be a confrontation with the state whether they allow it and however that plays out we're, we're unsure but what's interesting is how do the working class play a part in that other than just attend these marches and wave the flags and turn up as a crowd because irrespective of what happens with the national question which is the prism through which we see everything mm. in Scotland at the moment and for the foreseeable future these social and economic crises that are affecting Europe Mm -hmm. and developed countries across the world, they're going to come here eventually as well. There's just a bit of a lag because we are are focused on an independence question at the moment. How did the working class engage in that political process as an organised class? How do we do that? That It seems to me that is a problem because I am a bit sceptical whether that sort of cross-class alliance that you were talking about earlier that's historically been part of radical movements. I think the gulf between the intelligentsia of the left and the working class is so large Mm -hmm. that's probably not going to be bridged. So it's going to be left to the working class to organise herself into some sort of progressive, anti-fascist, independent movement. Yeah. In Scotland, that's going to be very difficult because you're squeezed politically with the national question. But I think it has to happen, Mm -hmm. or if no... The right, the far right, will gain a foothold in our communities. I tell you what, I think will happen with that kind of intelligence element, which after the working class sort of departed the the stage to a significant degree in political terms and organisational terms in the last 20, 30 years, a lot of them retreated into academia, and that's why now the left's a very academic kind of subculture in society. I've got a friend who always says um, class will out. There's, there's class conflict is irrepre- irrepressible in class society. It will continually reemerge because of the contradictions of class society. When it does, that in that inside that intelligentsia, some people will run from it and some people will return to the fold. And it's hard to say 
who will do what. That's a process that you can actually see with Brexit. A lot of people who reckon themselves very radical have basically apostatized in the face of a very major social crisis. Because, and this is something, by the way, that's happened throughout history. I mean, there was a, there's a kind of hilarious lineage of, for example, in the Russian Revolution, lots of anarchists who were underground anarchists for a long time, once the Russian Revolution broke out, became monarchists. Because they were suddenly horrified by the appearance of the mob on the street and the strikes in the factories, and society was in chaos. And they were thinking, is that is chaos what I, what I wanted? So when society comes under strain, you'll see people who give themselves radical credentials, you'll see the ways that they turn. And I still think that some people in the broad kind of left-wing intellectuals and stuff, some people will move in the direction of that new pole once the working class re-engages as, as an organisational force. Some will just completely abandon any pretense and hug the centre. And that's current, currently a process which I think is underway. Um, how does how does the working class for, found new forms of organisation uh, and represent those in the political crisis? It's so hard to say, and it's difficult to guess a mass democratic process like that before it takes full form. I think that some of the work that's being done around tenants' unions is vitally important. That's obviously going to be a major building block. Housing is an issue in general. Yep. It's obviously going to become a major uh, stable because the form that capitalism, that Britain, British capitalism now has, highly financial, financialised, essentially totally dependent on inflating housing prices with all of the... I mean, uh, here in Edinburgh we can see the, the, the implications and the impact from that. So that's clearly a part of it. Um, but I also think, and this is a kind of wider debate, it will always require a political expression. I don't mean a parliamentary one. I mean, that may be part of it. I mean um, it will always require an expression that takes on the state directly. This is a classic kind of debate of anti-capitalist politics about the relationship between syndicalism and anti-capitalist politics. You know, is, is, is self-organisation for immediate demands uh, sufficient or does it require a greater... Um, push out against the state that concentrates the the forces of the working class against the state. But like I say, um, how that happens here's the, here's the other thing. When when class outs again in a big way, it will be an opportunity for people who are currently imagine themselves to be radical and capitalists, or whatever, to learn. You know, part of the problem of the left as a milieu these days is that it's been so long since it's had very substantial um, bo- you know, movements from which it could learn the course and the dynamics of class politics. And that leads to a huge amount of confusion and demoralisation and defection to, to, to sort of liberalism and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so I, I totally agree with you that we should anticipate the return of class politics. France, obviously, they've got their own dynamics. But look, movements that approximate that kind of political sentiment, as you say, will arrive here. It must do, because of the, the social conditions. It'll be an opportunity to learn and examine the, the forms of organisation that the working class comes up with in this, uh, in this century, I think. And one of the things that we have to be doing at the moment, as I, as I think I said earlier, we're definitely in a period of, sort of experimentation, mm-hmm. and trying out new ideas, mm-hmm. and trying to see what form of organisation even is the correct way ahead and uh, and in many ways re-engaging with some of these older traditional yeah. questions politically but we also live in a world of new forms for doing that like social media yeah i'm just intrigued by what you make of social media i mean i i kind of i really enjoy twitter you know, yeah. i shouldn't really admit that i don't think but i really enjoy twitter but it, it can you can you know, share different ideas, meet people like yourself mm-hmm. who you meet in, in terms of uh, that you follow and get interesting things. But there's definitely something really unpleasant about it as well. Yeah, yeah. And particularly, I'm sure it happens everywhere, but in, in Scotland, Scottish Twitter, as we call it, when you're, <laughs> um, when you're on that politically, unless you're following the party line, it can be very unpleasant. It doesn't bother me at all because obviously I've had people send me death threats and yeah. abuse for 30 odd years so I'm yeah. quite relaxed about it. But I can see other people that they, they, if people are a bit fragile and it's really, really difficult I think and a lot of these anonymous accounts are clearly oh, yeah, co- yeah. there's really coordination about it as yeah. well. What it makes, I think it makes it really difficult for us to have these type of exchange of ideas where 
I mean, if I go on Twitter, I have a point of view. It's not that I think everybody should follow me. It's not that I think I'm yeah. right. It's just that let's let's talk it through. Let's let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's, it's, it's very difficult to do that now. As I say, it doesn't really bother me because I just press the mute. But I never block anybody. By the way, I've never blocked anybody in my life on Twitter. If they want to yeah. shout, let them shout. They're just howling at the moonlight. But uh, how do you how do you use that in the sense of me? Because I know it's like yourself and other people involved with you. You would get a bit of criticism as well if you uh, take a position that's different from the Scottish government. My God, they're on top of you. Like. No, I know, but the, the, maybe you get this as well. But um, I'm I'm sometimes spoiling for a fight and I can't get one <laughs> because I, I've got a bit of reputation where I'll, I'll bite your legs, as was mm. once said of someone in the Labour Party. Um, but it, and it's also you know I mean I know um, uh, women activists that I work with a lot. They really get it, yeah. and you can tell that there's a gendered aspect to that. You can tell that there's an attitude that uh, you know mouthy women yeah. should shut up, and when they say something which is deemed controversial, it's like a total pile on. And I agree with you that it's difficult in that forum to have nuanced and interesting and sophisticated debates because people are, and like I said as well, I mean parts of the left are just determined to denounce. It's it's a it's a really great feeling to denounce people, yeah. um, because it automatically shows you up to be sophisticated and morally superior and all and, and all the rest. So there's that as well. It's interesting the class divisions between different uh, social media outlets because Twitter is famously the kind of network of middle class professionals. Mm. I mean, there's obviously quite a lot of working class users as well, but you can see that very obviously Facebook's much broader, and so there's a much there's almost a higher level of discussion on on on, on politics on Facebook. Um, just because of it, you know, you can you can have a proper argument on it. I mean, it's quite it can be quite kind of degenerate as well, you know, um, the arguments that go on. Um, but yeah, it, Twitter's amusing to me because of the extent to which um, it's like one of these professional networking sites like LinkedIn, except you don't have to pay any money for yeah. it. Um, and so every wannabe uh, is on there, sort of. Uh, and and as someone once said to me. Uh, you don't have an account on Twitter unless you've got some kind of eagle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, it's just it's sort of constantly explosive and so on. I mean, I've got a kind of mixed view on... When I was first getting involved in anti-capitalist politics, lots of people who I met thought that the internet would completely transform absolutely everything. Uh, and it would be an enormous boon to the left, horizontal communication, we don't need the media anymore, etc. Of course, it's not turned out to be like that at all because the problem of growing anti-capitalist, pro-working class ideas in society is not just a problem that we don't control the media, uh, it's also a problem of ideology. So when you have loads of people online, they're also circulating ruling class ideology. And Twitter is a very obvious example of that. It's a, a quite a hardcore cadre of professionals, media workers, educators, uh, politicians, political actors, you name it, circulating essentially ruling class ideology uh, and the other problem of course is that commercial interests were never going to remain outside of that uh, and now we're seeing quite an interesting cannibalisation of the internet by huge corporations and it'll be interesting to see the direction in which that goes but I still think that um, it can still provide you with interesting to with useful tools for building an organisation, we've all done that we've all used yeah. um, various different types of social media and, and so on to, to, to build organ, organisational stuff I'm sure in some corners it's still somewhere where interesting debates happen um, but I do think you need forums outside of it yeah. you know, you would never get the kind of behaviour in a, in a meeting of 50 people that you see in a, in a deranged Twitter thread of 50 people. You'd never see... The, and it's partly it's that kind of psychological thing of road rage. People don't punch each other when they bump into each other on the pavement of the street. Some people do. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, people do jump out of their cars and hit each other, and it's because there's no face-to-face -face contact. Yeah. There's no need for empathy, because it's just an abstract Twitter account, and so that's the kind of stuff that goes on. But, yeah, I still think the left desperately needs forums away from there where there are serious, mature sort of d discussions and debates that take place. Yeah. And recognising that we didn't have all the answers. We yeah, yeah, some of the questions, but we didn't have all the, nobody's claiming to have all the answers, so I think it is important that we try and have that sort of cross-fertilisation. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I talked about you. Just to finish off, I like to uh, always mention James Connolly. Oh, yeah, in, in every conversation in life, yeah. generally. <laughs> but, um, and we'd love to have seen James Connolly on Twitter. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> one of the fortunate things, I think, for working class, progressive people in, in Scotland is that we have people like Connolly and McLean. So 
we're very fortunate that you know other people might leave the reservation, as it were, and mm. go into um, all different types of sort of political ideologies as they drift away. But we are fortunate in the Connolly Society when we re- we had the return to Connolly strategy for about 2006, 2007, something like that. But that was the idea, was that, OK, the world's a changed place and maybe some of the things that we had fought were solid, had melted into, mm. into thin air. But we were lucky that we had James Connolly to return to. Mm-hmm. No as a way of giving us answers for our problems now, but just as giving us a sort of solid base mm-hmm. that we could return to when we needed to. Mm-hmm. And I think McLean's the same sort of positive influence. I mean, I just wonder, I mean, what do you make of e- e- that type of history, revolutionary history that's here in Scotland and in our, in our working class communities, but it's almost completely absent from the debates we're having around about independence, Brexit, working mm. class, which is almost incredible, because if you read James Connolly, I mean, all the stuff we're talking about, SNP strategy, about looking to change flags and, you know, whatever, nobody wants a bit of political independence, but they're nobody want to touch economic independence. Yeah, I mean, yeah. James Connolly is very clear on that. It's no worth crossing the street for. I mean, and now a hundred odd years later, we're still in the city of his birth where he lived longer than anywhere else. And yet he's almost completely absent. And if you mention him, it's like, oh my God, let's, yeah, make, let's I mean, not go there. Connolly, Connolly is interesting in that we, we, we are just, you know, we're having the 100 year centenary of 1919 and the discussion of Maclean has been muted. The discussion of Connolly around uh, the 1916 centenary was non-existent. And it's still the case that you'd struggle to build and maintain a statue of Connolly in the city, in the city of his birth. Which is incredible given that he is a global figure. I mean, one of your earlier uh, podcasts on the global impact of the Irish Revolution is fascinating. For that, you remember, the Irish diaspora is absolutely gigantic and carried his name all over the world. But also, he's a, he's a, a well-known uh, personage in um, like anti-colonial movements yeah. uh, all over the world, uh, among a certain generation in particular. So he has this global character in the city of his birth, we can't talk about him. I mean, how many radio programmes or TV programmes were made about Connolly in, in, in the 1916th centenary? And obviously that's to do with a few things. One is um, what he did. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating that... Um, this is always a thing they say about uh, Marx in, in the university as well. Marx, people love to discuss Marx in university. They'll never discuss Lenin. Because putting your beliefs into practice is dangerous and vulgar and violent and nasty. And that's how Connolly is seen to, a, to an extent as a, as a dangerous fanatic who behaved irresponsibly, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And partly that's also, I think, the legacy of sectarianism. No one wants to admit that if you put uh, a statue of one of the most famous Scots in history in Edinburgh, it would be under constant threat of vandalism because of uh, because of kind of uh, loyalists and, uh, and so on. And also, of course, that, I mean, it's not just loyalists, it's also this city's establishment for the longest time uh, has had a kind of Protestant supremacist identity and wouldn't want that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it speaks to some to many of the consistent kind of problems of, of, uh, of Scottish society. But I think, and, you know, you always get, get people on the left who say, oh, you're just the, the 1917 reenactment society. And I dare say <laughs> you've been called the 1916 reenactment <laughs> society any number of times. Um, and, of course, like, you don't, you, you can't just have an eye to the past. But I've always thought, that a big part of the left's intellectual and cultural life has always been the remembrance of its traditions, its traditions of action in terms of the things that it's done, and its intellectual tradition. And I don't think that you can sustain a viable left without a sense of those traditions. Um, you know, movements need to recall the, the, the theorizations of the past, to know where they're going in the future. You need to know where you're coming from. Um, movements need heroes. Like I've never, I've never thought that was vulgar or childish. Um, movements need heroes to instruct us of what we should aspire to, what we should aspire to achieve in society. And I, I think this is another area where I feel like we've spent ages bashing the left, but <laughs> this is another area where um, the left doesn't have really a sense of the importance of that culture anymore. Uh, and I think it's vitally important for for keeping people. Uh, on a on a on a on a path when the world is becoming a very complex uh, and difficult place to to manoeuvre. And I, I'm always fond of saying to people that James Connolly is, of course, a figure from the past, hmm. but 
I think he's also a figure from our future, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and society needs to catch up with James Connolly. Yeah, and when we do catch up, he'll be there waiting on us. Yeah. So, David, where can we catch you? The uh, Common Space Podcast. Yeah. So, so I, every Friday I do the uh, Beyond the Noise uh, podcast. Yeah, it comes out every Friday. You can find it anywhere you get uh, podcasts from, and if you uh, sign up on SoundCloud. You can get it sent to you uh, via email every week. Excellent. David, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you.